Well, welcome to those online. If you don't have a prayer sheet, they're kind of on the back side doors and some are up here. So if you'll grab one, we're going to be working through that. I uh, want to just start off with a, a few things to think about. Uh, let's look. First off, this, this coming uh, Sundays for the month of August, the 21st is our mission report night, that Sunday night at 5. I encourage you to come on out and be a part of that as our folks share about their mission trips and things that have happened on that. On the 28th, Sunday night the 28th, Jason Thomas is going to teach from 4.30 to 6.30, and he's doing a complete overview of the fall of what's coming at us. Normally, he does something a little longer and a, even a lot more in-depth for our Sunday school teachers. This time, I've asked for just an overview and to get people excited and get some folks some, th some things to think about with the fall coming. Uh, and I'm excited about the fall being here, and I'm thankful Jason's going to do that. But August 28th, we'll jump into that that Sunday night. Then September 4th, I know that's a holiday weekend for many people. That Sunday night at 5 o'clock, we just keep adding stuff to that night, okay? We've decided to do a picnic inside. So let me define that. That means you're going to get to have a hamburger in Big House. That means you're going to travel to the sanctuary where we're going to try a little 45-minute film out on our fancy video screens and nice sound system. And you heard me say 45 minutes, so your kids are going to be with you, all right? Uh, we think they can sit through that. We've asked Pastor Bart to choose one of his favorite episodes from the series The Chosen, which is about Jesus' life. You always hear about it. A lot of people haven't watched it. I'm hoping we get drawn in by watching an episode and realizing there's a lot more to that than we realize. When we finish that, we're going to walk back to the Fellowship Hall. I'm hoping before you went to eat your hamburger that you dropped some homemade ice cream off in this room, okay? And if you didn't, I'm hoping you brought me a half gallon of your favorite flavor for me to share with everybody, and I put it in the freezer already. We're going to have toppings here, but I do ask if you, if you would make some homemade ice cream for me or bring me a half gallon of your favorite ice cream, but we just want to have fun. I am going to give prizes out, so if you have any idea how to operate a homemade ice cream machine, please do it for us, okay? We want to have fun. Uh, we want to enjoy that time. Sunday, our Sunday school class got together, and David Huffman brought his ice cream machine, and he pretty much made it while we were having lunch and dessert. And it's like everybody ate homemade ice cream like two hours later, and it was awesome. So I know how good it is. So come be a part of that. So we got uh, three really good things all happening in the same night. Uh, on top of that, I'm thinking we're going to have the Chosen episode kind of running on these TVs in here, but it's the after show where the actors talk about it. And so if you're one of those people that just wants to eat dry ice cream and not really talk to people, you just kind of kick back and watch that in the background. If you want to visit and watch how much ice cream I can eat, that's a good time just to, to do that. But uh, I encourage you to be a part of that with us. We're looking forward to that, that good time. But a lot of good stuff. Our kids are going back to school. A lot of kids back in school this week. College kids are returning. Uh, we need to be praying for them. Is uh, They're all back on the roads and traveling and just getting started right. And so please keep them in your prayers. This coming Sunday, we're talking about Solomon, uh, the worshiping king. So, uh, And so it's out of 1 Kings chapter 8. You'll want to read verses uh, 10 through 21, and then drop over, unless you want to read straight through, but 33 through 43. So chapter 8, 10 through 21, and then skip a little and read verses 33 through 43, still staying focused on Solomon and the kind of man he was and things that he went through. Uh, this week we had some very, very sad news. Uh, Kathleen, I'm sorry, oh my goodness, Diane McCall, uh, ended up passing away, and her funeral is tomorrow uh, here at, at the church from 8 to 10 is visitation. There is visitation going on tonight at Hickson Brothers, so, so please uh, stop by if you'd like to do that. But the funeral is at 10 a.m. for Miss Diane McCall. She's the, the wife of Kenneth McCall. She's got two sons, uh, Jason and Chris, and if you just keep them in your prayers. They came up today. They shared a lot preparing for the the funeral tomorrow, and they're such a sweet family, and they shared so many sweet things about their mom. I, I can't tell you enough. I mean, it's it's sweet what boys will say about their moms and the things that they remember and the scary things they're going to probably talk about you one day to my moms out there, but they do love their moms, and uh, what a blessing that was to share with them. Now, thinking about those in the hospital, let me uh, go ahead and mention, continue to pray for Ellie Brunson. 
Uh, she is still in the, kind of the uh, outside of the hospital, still trying to get better each day. And we will be praying for her. Sherry Walker, we just need to pray that she continues to heal up from her procedure. Chris Munger, I got to see him Sunday. He's a, Chris broke his foot uh, severely, had surgery. Chris was here on his scooter for Sunday school, Sunday morning, then he popped in the Sunday school party for a time, and then he left because he's wearing down quickly. Pray for his healing. Jim Cooley made a, a trip or two to the hospital this last week uh, dealing with COVID and pneumonia, but he is home and he is doing better. Kathleen McCall has uh, been dealing with a very injured foot for some time, and she recently found out she's going to need to stay off that for probably six months. So sometimes I almost just prefer to have surgery when you get something like that, but please pray for Ms. Kathleen and Mr. Freddie as he works with her on that. Doris Mott uh, had shared that she has had a foot injury and has asked for prayer with that. And Lindsay Vickery had her port readjusted, and evidently it was a pretty intensive surgery, but we're praying that that port works perfectly in the months to come and that she'll get what she needs. Uh, we already mentioned Kenneth the loss of his wife, and I want to mention Robin the loss of her grandfather, uh, Donald Bird. He lived in Natchez, so if you'd remember them. And if you look in the top right in the box on the side, you'll see Miss Linda Creel is in uh, Sioux City, Iowa, doing mission work. So, Miss Linda, we're going to be praying for you tonight. The doors are open for you as you share the gospel. So, are there any others that you might like to add? Yes, ma'am. All right. What is her name? We've got Haley Dunn in Florida. She's going to be having a baby tomorrow. So uh, keep, keep her in your prayers for those online, others. I'm just glad you are here tonight. So uh, let's pray. Our sweet Heavenly Father, God, we, uh, we just walk in your presence and we, we say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for walking with us. Uh, Lord, for those in this room right now, I know they have so many things going on in their hearts and and their, their jobs and their careers and the concerns and, and medically, Lord. And, and God, just help us to, to continue to put those into the proper place. And Lord, for us to focus on what you have for us, Lord, and continue to reach out to, to those around us. God, I ask you to, to be with the, all of these on, on our prayer sheet tonight, Lord, and in our entire church, especially those not spoken. Lord, I ask that you continue to heal Ellie Brunson so she can return to her own home with her parents, uh, hopefully very soon. God, I ask you to, to be with Sherry Walker and to help her uh, to fully heal from this procedure. And the same for Chris Munger with his, his foot. Lord, I ask you to be with Bill Mount, who's had his knee surgery. He's finally gotten to go home. Lord, keep his spirits up and allow this knee surgery to, to, to do what it needs to do. Lord, thank you for, for taking Jim Cooley through a very tough time, and we ask for complete healing in his life. And Lord, for Kathleen McCall, I ask you just to, to be with her foot. I know the weeks have already added up and, and many more yet to come. And the same for Miss Doris Mott, Lord, that God, you just keep her spirits up and focus as she continues to, to battle to get back where, where she's wanted to be for so long. God, uh, the same for Lindsay Vickery, God. Lord, that she wouldn't be just down and, and dealing with things and feeling overwhelmed, but Lord, be in her life and, and bless her. And God, take care of Miss Linda Creel as she ministers uh, ministers to the world, whether it's on street corners, you know, walking down in shops. Lord, we just ask for a prayer of protection for her as she is there doing mission work and whatever it takes to, to share the gospel. Lord, bless her and protect her. God, I ask you to be with Kenneth McCall right now and his family, Lord, as they deal with visitation at this moment. Uh, Lord, it's, it's been a hard week for him, and he's, he's only surviving because you're, you're the Lord of his life and you're carrying him through it. God, be with his family and the loss of his, his sweet wife. Lord, I ask you to be with Robin and her family and the loss of her grandfather, Lord, and, and we're thankful for the life that he lived. God, I ask you just to, just to walk with us in everything we do. God, we ask for protection over Haley tomorrow in Florida, Lord, as, as 
as she gives birth. And, and God, just bless that. Bless that entire day. And let it be a sweet, sweet moment. God, thank you for, for our church. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for just the chance as we all get to reach out and help each other sometimes. Lord, uh, let that let our hearts never grow cold or hard toward doing that. Allow us to to be the people of you, Lord, to, to make a difference in this world. God, I ask you to be with our pastor as he speaks tonight. I ask you to uh, continue to guide the leadership in this church, all areas. Uh, God, that we'll, we'll continue to, to seek you out. And Lord, that your word would be the center of our, of our lives. Lord God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, how's everybody? Got a new table set up tonight, kind of left over from our gathering today. I kind of like it. It's pretty cool. Very good. Let's pray. All right, Father, thank you for letting us be together this evening. We continue to pray for Kenneth and his sons and their family. Uh, Lord, in the departure of one so dear to us, we ask you to give grace and mercy to them that there would be joy in believing, joy that sustains them in times of deep sorrow and a sense of loss. I pray this in Jesus' name. Would we also ask you to give grace to us as we open your word, that we would be filled with your spirit, that we may gain insight and understanding from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, grab your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 10. I want to talk to you this evening. I shared this message with our deacons on Monday night. And so a couple of folks that are here, it's a little repeat for them tonight. But I really am um, moved by this text and especially in light of so many folks that are struggling. Now, one of the things that I know about uh, our walk with the Lord is we are typically either heading into a time of challenge, trial, testing, temptation, or in a time of testing and trial and temptation, or maybe coming out of it. But it's 
sort of the common experience of life to be brought into trial. And there's lots of teaching from Jesus about it. There's lots of teaching from the apostles and a great deal of ink in the New Testament is about how to handle adversity. In fact, if you really study the book of Hebrews, the heart of the book is to rest yourself in three things. And that is who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and where he's taken you. If you really want to outline the book of Hebrews and say, what's it about? That's it. It opens up and says, this is who Jesus is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's summarized in the beginning, very much like in Colossians, similar language. And it just lays out who he is. And then it says, in from literally chapter 2 all the way to chapter 12, it's what he's done for us. But woven into that is where he's taken us. The assurance of our salvation and our heavenly reward. And when he makes all things new, our participation in all of the blessings of him making all things new. So the book of Hebrews was written about those three topics, who he is, what he's done for us, and where he's taken us, because life is hard, and because life is challenging, and it's disappointing, and it's sorrowful, and it's, um, it's hard. Just, there are just seasons when you go through, and you think, man, I didn't think it was going to be like this. And so one of the things that God has been stirring in my heart over the last months, and it probably goes back way more than that, but the last few months, coming out of COVID and the world's a little different, the world's just a little bit more negative. It's not that it wasn't negative before, but like you really can't turn on the TV without it just being negative. It's just negative. And uh, that's just kind of how the news feeds are. It's kind of how... Whatever's going on the internet, Twitter is like a dumpster fire. Facebook, I don't, I wouldn't even go there. I just stay off of Facebook. It's like, because my my general response to a few minutes on Facebook is, "Are you kidding? You're a Christian. Are you kidding?" That's so. I don't need to do a lot of the "Are you kidding?" stuff. So I just stay away from it. And um, and so there's there's a need for us to be aware that you need to be an encourager and that that needs to be a part of your character. Not, oh, I need, um, I don't have the gift of encouragement. I'm more prophetic. Um, That's not really how that works. Uh, Some of the greatest prophets were the greatest encouragers. Jeremiah, for example, uh, was among the greatest who've ever been a prophet and his encouragement is, runs deep. In fact, in Lamentations, you have this great lament, and we get that great chapter 3, verse 22, that the loving kindness of the Lord never ceases. It's new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So we make songs about this encouragement that he gives. And so I really wanted you to think about your role as an encourager and how you use your mouth and how you use your time, and how you use your resources um, to be an encourager. So that's the topic, because life is hard, and you really never know what people might be going through. Uh, So let's kind of look at the text and talk about how the writer to the Hebrews develops his thought here. I think it's really good. It begins, Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. So let me just kind of say to you, he's reminding you that who Jesus is and what he's done for you and where he's taking you is is rested in the faithful promises of God and that you can rest in those. So that's kind of 
the premise of his conversation with the folks at this point. He says, okay, the reason I'm telling you this and the reason you can do it is that God's faithful. This new heart you've been given by Christ and by the new birth is able to lay hold of these promises and, and enjoy them and grow in them and, and rejoice in them. So that's kind of how he starts. But let's read on through the text. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. Not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. So the introduction to this section is, let us hold on. I want to just develop that thought with this idea. Everyone is living under the weight of something, and they're holding on or they're bearing under it. This is a universal thing. On any given Sunday, it's likely you'll sit among people who seriously contemplated taking their life that very week. And you'll actually be among some, and I can tell you because I know, that walked right up to the edge and something stopped them. Someone, they didn't take their life. And so... On any given Sunday when you gather, there are people that are so deeply hurting that they are surprised they made it there, not because their car was you know, not going to make it, but because they may have taken their life during the week. And so if you layer that with all of the other things that folks are just challenged with through the course of the week, life is really hard and everyone is living under the weight of something whether it's financial stress or marital stress or physical stress or the feeling of loss or the emotional weight of things not going well in some of their connections with others, or the feelings when your body is not as capable as it once was, or just lots of things that go on. And so everyone's feeling that. And as a result, they're either you know, holding on, you know, by the thread, or they're bearing under. Now, the thought that came to me is that when you think about that weight that we live under, there's kind of two temptations that come with the weight of life and sorrow and challenges and disappointments and all of the things that happen There's kind of two things. There's one sense in which you just get crushed under it. It finally becomes so overwhelming that you literally just give up and you no longer try to bear up. You're just crushed under it. And sometimes that leads into depression. Sometimes it leads into bitterness. Sometimes it leads into anger. Sometimes it leads into just losing heart and not trying anymore. At the same time, there's also a temptation not just to give up, but to get out from under the weight and to bolt one's responsibilities, to kind of go headlong into sin, to get rid of the responsibilities. I don't want this Christianity thing anymore. It just, it's hard. I can't do it. I don't want the, the weight of my family or my responsibilities. I, and, and the idea of kind of getting away, maybe it's through a little... Uh, recreational drugs, maybe it's through a little alcohol, maybe it's through some sexual escapades on the side or pornography. There's tons of things that it can be to try to escape that sense of weight. And rather than, you know, giving up and being crushed by it, it's like, I just need some escape from it. Maybe you buy stuff to try to feel better about yourself. or There's a lot of things that we're tempted. Now, the weight itself is just the weight of fallenness. And it affects all of us differently. 
For some, the weight of fallenness is just a general sense of discouragement. For others, it's a constant battle with personal failure, sinful failure. For others, it's just weariness, just I'm tired. I keep trying to be a good parent. I keep trying to be a good mom. I keep trying to be a good dad. But literally, I'm just, I get up some mornings and I wonder, how can I, how can I take another step today and how can I do this one more time? I'm just whooped. And so I think that this is fairly universal. I do think that it's seasonal. In other words, it may not be happening to you right now, but it's likely going to at some point. I remember a time in my life I didn't worry about anything. And, and, and that life is real different from that right now. I remember a time it's just, I was just so happy go luck. It's like nothing bothered me at all. But I don't feel that way anymore. So I think there's seasons of lives. So let's go back um, to the text. Because what the writer to the Hebrews says is, uh, you need to hang on. You need to hang in there. You need to stay under the load of responsibility of walking in Christ and all of the temptations of this world, the work of the world, the work of the flesh, the work of the devil that's working on you. You need to know that you don't have to give up and just crumble under it. There's help available. And you don't need to try to escape it in some kind of deceptive thing that would bring you into some kind of pleasure and some kind of sense of, ah, man, that's relief. And so the writer of the Hebrews says, let's hold on. Now, understand that as he writes this, the persecution in their day was very high. Uh, If you'll open up to chapter 10 of Hebrews and just kind of scroll down, I'll I'll pull up my my Bible program here, and, and you see as chapter 10 closes... It says, remember the earlier days, that's verse 32, when after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions. At other times, you were companions of those who were treated that way. For you sympathized with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confiscation of your possessions because you know that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession So don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you need endurance so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what was promised. So he's taking into account that they're hurting. But the passage in chapter 10, 23 through 25, isn't so much about your self-awareness. There are other passages in Hebrews that are about your self-awareness. This is one of them, 33 through 36. In 23 through 25, it's a little bit different. So looking at our text again, everyone is living under the weight of something, holding on, bearing under. A lot of times what we do at this point is we're internally saying, Amen, this is true of me. This is describing my life of the past month or the past year or the past decade or the past 10 minutes, whatever. This is, yeah, I'm in there. Or I remember when I went through that five years ago or whatever. Yeah, and it's like, amen. But that's not what the writer's wanting you to do here. He's wanting you to actually go a little further. And, and that's why he says, and let us consider one another. So, here we go. The first part of being a, a, an encourager is considering. The word consider means to study, to be attentive to, to focus on. It's, um, it's kind of like what you do when you're really looking at something. You don't just glance at it and notice it. You take such note that you begin to study it a little bit and notice details. And so in this message of becoming an encourager, he's asking you to get outside of yourself for a minute and to take a look around 
and to look at the people that God has put in your path. He's put in your life. He's put in your church. He's put in your small group. He's put in your family. He's put in your neighborhood to look at them. And to go beyond judging them, which is really easy, and to go beyond ignoring them and to just really look at them and to consider them. And that's what he says. What you need to do is we need to consider one another. This is one of the one another's, by the way. You know, you got love one another, forgive one another, bear one another's burdens. You got like 56 one another's in the New Testament. But this is one of the unusual ones. It's consider one another. It means to study what makes the other person tick. What's their thing? It means to care about them enough to give attention to figure them out. And so he's saying, take time to consider and notice others because it's not about you. You see, when we come to church, it's very easy to get self-focused. I want my temperature. I want my seat. I want my habit. I want my favorite music. I want my timetables. I, there's a lot of my that goes into church. And, and, and we've had people tell us, if you don't do certain things, um, I probably won't come. And, you know, and, and when we hear things like that, it's, it's a very, it kind of gets to be about one's own self. And um, this, is a, this is a challenging thing to work through because we are by nature self-centered. We just are. That's us. We just were born that way. We cry when we're hungry and cry when we wet our diaper and we're just kind of self-centered. We just need some attention to ourselves, and we're dependent on others. And, and so there's a very innate part of the fall that makes us self-centered and that self-centeredness moves into the body of Christ when we should be very other-centered, sort of a Philippians chapter 2 not looking out for your own self-interest, but also you should be looking out for the interests of others. And so, considering. And this is, a, this is not him asking you if this is your gift. Some people, it's their gift. They just, they're very considerate. We use the word. They're very considerate of others. And we say, well, that, that's the most considerate person I know. And it's because they're considering the other person's situation and they're working toward meeting whatever they've learned from their consideration. So we say, that person's very considerate. They saw that I didn't have a seed, they found me one. They saw I didn't know which way to go and they directed me. So we say, that person's considerate. It's because they look and they consider and they say, hey, that guy looks lost. I bet he's looking for a Sunday school class or the bathroom. I'm going to help him. And so you consider him and therefore you respond to what you see. And so that's what this word means. It means we're considerate of each other. We look at, and it's not about me. It's, it's about them. It's getting outside of ourselves. And then he goes on and says, all right, we consider each other with a goal. And the goal is to provoke. In other words, I am sizing up others because I want to provoke them. Now, not in the kind of provocation you see on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever thing that's out there where people are provoking each other to wrath. They're trying to poke each other and make each other mad with their words and get a rise out of them and a response out of them and an action out of them. Um. That's not what he means to provoke here. He says he's going to provoke them to love and to good works. In other words, I need to size up others and say to myself, how can I spur love and good works in their life? How can I do that? What aid am I toward them being more loving and more engaged in the work of Christ. How do I do that? And so we're considering one another in order to provoke 
these two things, love and good works. So that's what the next point is, is that we're provoking. My sizing up and finding out about people is to provoke them toward loving Christ and loving their neighbor. I want to provoke them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I want to provoke them to love their neighbor as their self. Because that's how healthy communities are promoted. By people who love God and love their neighbor. And so, how do I provoke love? And how do I provoke good deeds? By loving and doing good deeds. This is really a simple one. This is not like... a this is not like a chemistry assignment where you're going to go home and figure out all the calculations and you got this homework. It's really simple. How do you provoke love? Love provokes love. We love because he first loved us. Love provokes love. When people know that they're loved, it's amazing the impact that it has. That's why we get these scriptures that says love one another. It's a simple thing. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is really beautiful. And so the way that I provoke love is to give love, to be loving. Now, love has lots of shapes and sizes. It's not always nice and cuddly. Sometimes it's... Uh, redemptive or preventative. I mean, if I love my child and they're heading out toward the street, I may have to say, stop! And that's a very loving act. And uh, so there, love has lots of shapes and sizes. It's not just having this nice warm fuzzy about the person. And then doing good to others. So think through the way that the writer to the Hebrews is thinking. He's going, everybody's out there needing to hold on to the confession of their hope without wavering. They need to hang on. They need to be able to bear up under the weight of responsibilities and and, and the, the, the life of the Christian. They need to be able to bear up under the weight of temptation. And they need to do so without being crushed by it. And they need to do so without trying to escape from it. And so you need to study them and the load they're under. And you need to think about, how do I help them with their load? How do I get beside them under the load? How do I come alongside and keep them from bolting to get out from under the load? How do I take part in helping them hold on? And so his thinking is brilliant, as all biblical writers are. Is he saying, hey gang, we need to hang on. We need to hang on all the way to the end. We need to not be crushed by the weight of our responsibility of living the life of Christ in a world that hates Him and in the flesh that's always tempting us and the devil that's always oppressing us. And we need to not be crushed by that weight because we've got brothers and sisters that will help us bear up under it as a family. And we need to not bolt out from under that weight. And so you need to start studying each other and you need to start finding out how can I help them hang on? What am I going to do in that person's life that gives them the ability to hang on? And how do I do it in a way that welcomes them to help me hang on? Because when it says encouraging one another, it means that there's some reciprocity, a reciprocal thing going on there. We're going to get to that. Okay. So, everybody's under the weight. They're holding on or bearing under. We need to take time to consider, be considering each other, studying them. What weight are they under? How can I help them? That means I need to get to know them. I need to get to know people outside of my circle. Churches develop circles. Now, sometimes people call them cliques. And I think you can become cliquish. 
But I think you're just naturally gravitated toward groups of people that you just relate to well. But you have to get out of that. You have to move beyond what you're most comfortable and who you're most comfortable with into the realm of folks that you need to study by considering them what weight are they under and by loving them and doing good to them in a way that provokes them to want to do the same. I've noticed that when people in our church do loving good works to others, people say, I want to be like that person. They just say it. And I could list a a legion of names after that of people in our church that I've heard people say, I want to be like so-and-so, I want to be like so-and-so, I want to be like so-and-so. I'm going to tell you about one. His name's Rodney Robertson. Rodney would punch me in the face for mentioning him. Rodney's wife, Judy, became chronically and critically ill And for about 15 years, needed full-time, 100% round-the-clock care. And Rodney gave that to her. And he sacrificed all these areas of his life to take care of her. And all of us watched it. Many watched it from long before I was here. And the goodness that he showed and demonstrated to Judy, it it was literally amazing. But the most amazing thing of it was me sitting with Landon and Anna doing premarital counseling and Landon looking at Anna in all sincerity and saying, I want to love her like my granddad loved my grandmother. You see, he was provoked to love and good deeds, not by being told but by being shown. And Landon grew up in a house of great love because of that. Right across the lawn from his house was Rodney and Judy's house, and he spent his lifetime going over there and seeing that. And so how do you provoke love and good deeds? If you just do it. You do love to people, and you do good to people, and that provokes them to the same. And so... It's, uh, it's one of those things that just multiplies itself. So, then he gives another note and says, not neglecting to gather together. You know, if you grew up in church, you probably heard sermons on you ought to go to church. And I'm a big believer in that. I happen to gather here frequently. And so I'm a really big believer in gathering at church, but not legalistically. I don't want you to go out from any gathering, we say, and have some idea. Well, if I don't go to church, I'm going to hell. You know, you can just get, I'll just say it, you can just get stupid with your thinking sometimes. I did it. And legalism just makes us kind of dumb. When we're called to gather together, it's out of necessity, not obligation. One of the things that God has chosen to do is make all of us need each other in ways that we cannot comprehend. When Paul gives the illustration in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, and he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. And He just gives that list of all these body parts and then he talks about the unseemly body parts are even more important than the seemly ones, which is a really, if you dig into that text, it's kind of embarrassing to work through its meaning. And basically what he's saying is, is the stuff you tend to hide, you really need. (laughs) And so he has this idea that there is a design of necessity in every local body. And it does extend into the global body in ways as well. But in every local body. That you need to be together. Even if you don't know that you need it. You need it. Even if you don't think you do. That the design of God. Is that the body needs each other. And so we, we don't go on a rampage and say, oh, I'll tell you what, you know, we, we need more 
We need more people sitting in the pews. You can get really crazy about all this stuff. When we get together, we get together because we need each other. And we have to be convinced of that. And we have to become convinced that there are some people in this church that need you when you don't feel like being here. They need you. And there's a way that they need you that they can never explain nor you can ever understand. But in God's design, they need you. And so when he says not neglecting, can others count on me to gather with them? In other words, am am I just coming because I just want to be there and I know I'm going to get something that I want? Or do I have a sold-out belief that this group of people that are called to gather on this campus actually need each other in a way that none of us could ever explain this side of heaven? But it's true. Inescapably, biblically true. It's in God's design. That's why years ago I preached a sermon. It was pretty interesting as God led me up to it. I called it the Franken Church. And I said, part of the problem with central Louisiana is people tend to jump church to church to church in central Louisiana based on kind of how the church ebb and flow thing is going. Yeah, things are happening in one church. Yeah, let's all go there. Oh, things ain't going real good. Let's go to the other one. Is it, that's kind of a thing in central Louisiana. I think it's in other places too. But it's so big of a deal that Stuart Chafin Stuart Chafin, uh, uh, Stuart Holloway stood up and preached to us when we had our tri church Thanksgiving service a few years ago. It was us in Philadelphia and First Baptist. And he got up there and he said what everybody in the room knew. He said, Pretty much everybody in this room has been a member of all three churches. And we all looked around and everybody said, It's true. It's true. And he said, That's a problem. And so the Franken church idea is that the reason Frankenstein didn't work is that he was assembled from different bodies that weren't designed to go together. If you read the original Mary Shelley story, it's fabulous because Frankenstein was not a monster. Frankenstein was beautiful. And if you, there's only one edition of that that's ever come out that was really true to her tale because Frankenstein was a handsome guy. And then this stuff started growing as the body parts started rejecting each other. If you're not in the church that God's called you to be, you're franken-churching. And your part don't belong. (laughs) Now, I'm not smart enough to know when that is. But I think every heart that is redeemed is wise enough to know when it is. And so there's this beautiful thing of not neglecting So he says, not neglecting to gather together. And then he just says it, as some are in the habit of doing. You know, it's like, I know y'all are out there. You might not receive the letter that was sent out to the Hebrews, but you're going to hear that I mentioned y'all. And that is, you're not there. And you need to be there, not because of obligation, but necessity. And so uh, the, one of the ways that I explain it is anytime the church gathers, one person is bringing to the table of fellowship something that another person needs, and they're also, by coming to the table of fellowship, receiving something that they need. But often neither can actually be seen at the moment because it's a spiritual thing that's not always analyzable. But heaven knows, and that's why heaven gives us these instructions. And so not neglecting to gather together, which means we need each other. Deep. And there may be some day, and I'm going to tell you a story, blow your mind. I got to tell the story to a friend of mine just recently. Several years ago, one of my really good friends accidentally shot and killed his wife. It was New Year's night of 2007, New Year's Eve night of 2007. It was one of the most horrible things I've ever been involved in. The story behind it is just heartbreaking. There's a burglar that had been breaking in a series of houses in the neighborhood. 
the burglar had come to my friend's house and unscrewed all of his safety lights so that they were still in the socket but wouldn't come on. And he knew he was being set up. And uh, when he got up to go check on the burglar, he didn't know his wife went to the other end of the house. And when he saw her move, uh, he thought she was the burglar and he shot her. It was a horrid thing. And I asked Kingsville. I just moved here. I was brand new, 2007. And, um, uh, and so, excuse me, it's New Year's 2008. We're going from 2007 and 2008. I just moved here in September 2007. And so I, I asked everybody, I said, um, I need you to write a card to my friend Glenn. You just need to do it. And just tell him something. I don't care what you tell him. Tell him your favorite Bible verse, but write him a card. Everybody just, I want his mailbox to be stuffed for days. And, 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 and Kingsville did. In perfect Kingsville fashion, hundreds of cards went, went to Glenn and stuffed his mailbox. Couldn't get them all in there. It was great. For several days, it was just full of cards. Well, somewhere between six and nine months later, Glenn called me one day. So if you want to kind of gauge need, um, he said, I, I got to tell you something. He said, last night I sat down on the end of my bed and he said, I had my pistol in one hand and I had the cards from your church in my other hand and the cards from your church won and I'm still alive today. Now, when you think about need, you're at need at a level that that's inexplicable. I don't know whose card was the one that kept him there. But God used that one card that he finally flipped open and was holding in his hand the moment he had chosen he was going to take his life. And he read that card. That person doesn't know who they were. Glenn doesn't remember who they were. God knows who they were. They're going to get to heaven and to go, me? I thought it was the lamest card I ever sent. But he needed you. There is a way that we are interlinked by the Spirit that we need each other in ways that we don't even know. It's, it's a mystery. And so don't fail to gather just because you don't feel like it or don't think you'll get what you're looking for. You're as necessary here on any given day as I am. That's hard to take in, but it's true. In the body, there's only one head, and it ain't Bart. It's Jesus. And that means all the rest of us are of the same level of importance. And we need each other. So, how does he close? He says, don't fail to get together. And this is everything from the big church gathering to the life group gathering to the neighborhood gathering to the coffee shop. I spent two hours at the coffee shop. One of my favorite people on earth today, Wes McKay. And it was just great to be with him as brothers in the Lord and just it was just sweet yesterday we got to go to lunch with me and Steve and Toby and Wes and man that was just sweet good time together and so it's it's everything from one to one to the whole big group not neglecting we're not talking about falling into a legalistic mindset of I broke my leg and I'm missing church and therefore somebody's going to go to hell because I'm not there don't do that all right it doesn't work like that. But when you're capable, you're needed. You just, that's how it is. When you're capable, you're needed. Well, back in the old church covenants, you got to go back to ones written around in the 40s and earlier. There was a pledge you made in the covenant, and it was, I will make every gathering of worship unless... Is anybody old enough to remember the words? It was two words. Providentially hindered. Which translated in the Old English means God kept you from coming. It was a great pledge that they made back in the day about being together as a flock. So, we're not neglecting. So, let's look at the last thing. Instead, the word... But there is a, it means 
but instead, but rather, but opposite. In other words, neglecting is the opposite of encouraging. So he says, but encouraging each other. In other words, I need to be moving in love and good works into people's lives to help them bear up under what they're carrying. That needs to be a move that I intentionally make in the church. That in love and good deeds, I'm helping, I'm helping keeping them from bugging out and I'm helping keeping them from being crushed by the weight of the responsibilities of life. And there are different seasons. There are seasons that some of us are much more free to give our time than others are. And that is an ebb and flow in church. There are seasons when the kids are little and you're running ragged and staying up all night and you're just as tired. as You're the one that folks are actually going to be coming to help. And you might not be able to give as much. I'm in a season my kids are grown. I can do a lot more than I used to be able to do time-wise and not feel guilty about my evenings. I'm in a different place in life. And so being able with the ebb and flow of life to be there for people. And then he says, but encouraging each other, which is this. To give courage or to give heart are others strengthened to hold on by the words and actions that you are involved in. I'm going to take a little sidebar um, Churches are imperfect places, and there are times to be concerned and to bring things to people's attention to get them fixed because they're really imperfect places run by idiots like me, okay? And so there's mistakes you make. And so what I'm going to say after this isn't one of those things to say, oh, you should never critique your church. You should, honestly, you should be a very good critic of your church in the sense of not a critical spirit, but always wanting the best because what we're doing is unto the Lord. One of the most helpful times in my life was a guy named Connor Burns, guy I ride uh, ride bikes with in Natchez. We went on a bike ride one day and he said, I need to talk to you about your sermon today. And I'm like, okay. And he said, you were wrong. And I'm like, well, that's a pretty good start. (laughs) Connor loves me. He's a dear friend of mine. But he said, you presented Christ in a way that diminished his true humanity and made it look like he got a pass on the human condition. And I thought for a minute, and I said, you're exactly right. And I had to go back the next Sunday and I had to fix that. And I had to say, you know what? Last Sunday, I was making a point. And in order to make the point, I diminished another truth to try to make this truth stronger. I was working on some divinity issues of Christ. And I said, in order to do this, I actually messed this up. And thankfully, I had somebody that loved me enough to say, that wasn't right. We need that to be strong. We can't live without that. And so it doesn't mean, so my next statement isn't don't ever get and fix, don't ever work to fix things and make the church the most excellent it can be. But that's very different from a critical murmuring spirit. And if you develop a critical murmuring spirit, here's what happens. You add to the weight that people are bearing under. And you may be the one thing that breaks the last straw of strength they had to stay in church because they may have gotten hurt before in church. They may have been neglected in church. They may be suffering from something that nobody in the church knows about and they feel like nobody cares, but nobody knows that they're hurting. You come alongside them and molly grub with them and you say, yeah, I, boy, I tell you that church, blah, 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 blah. And they just are crushed because they needed you to be the church to them and lift this weight off of them. And instead, you just threw some heavy stuff up on the top that discouraged them and they were crushed under it. 
it's important to encourage each other. Even when there's things that are imperfect, there always will be. And we always have to work on it. But the beauty of this is, is when we come together and a guy loves me enough to take a bike ride with me and speak to me, he breathes life into the church. He didn't go and find his friend who was already discouraged about something in church and say, yeah, Bart, just he just told he's, I think he's a heretic. He didn't do that. He challenged me to grow and see my own error. And if we can't have an environment that challenges each other to grow and see our own errors, we can't grow up. We'll all stay baby Christians, pitching tantrums every time everybody, someone comes to us and says, you need to grow a little. And they're like, nah, not me. And so encouraging means to give courage to, all right, encourage to face what they're, they're, they're uh, uh, facing, and to give heart, that's really what the meaning of the word is. It means to strengthen the heart of someone. Well, how do you strengthen their heart? It's the same thing, love and good deeds. When you love them, it strengthens their heart. When you do good to them, it strengthens their heart. And it gives them encourage. And so what I want to ask is, when I spend time with somebody and I walk away from them, were they strengthened to hold on? Back here, were they strengthened to do this? To hold on to their confession of their hope without wavering? Or did I encourage their wavering because I was wavering? What this does is it does a couple of things. First, it gives us a new set of eyes when we come to church on Sunday. We need to look around and not just for our buds. It's easy to just find our faves when we get to church. That's just how life is. I'm so glad to see people that I'm really close to that it's easy to just kind of get in that groove rather than in the groove of, let me look around. Is there somebody sitting alone? Is there somebody new? Is there somebody that looks a little bit uncomfortable, timid? Is there somebody that suddenly changed where they were sitting in church and they went from up here to down here, down here to up here? I need to look around and I need to say, what's going on? Is there somebody whose spouse is missing? They're normally here. Is there somebody whose kids aren't there and they're normally here? Is there some youth that their parents who are normally here, they're not here? I'm considering. That's all I'm doing. I can't fix it all. But if there's 400 people thinking about fixing one, we'll do a really good job every Sunday. And just say, look, oh yeah. And there's a couple of folks in the church that are really good at it. I'm going to brag on one, and you can tell her I said her name. And and, and it's not because she's super saint. Jen Charbonneau has the gift of consideration. But it wasn't her natural gift. It was her chosen gift. She chose to be, she's considered Nathan, she loves him, her family, considered to me and works in the kitchen in Ecuador. But she has a way that when she gets to church, she doesn't just do the buds. She looks around and she finds somebody and she talks to them. And she'll get their name. I don't think I've met you before. What's your name? Can I get your contact information? That's, that's her. She does that. What if 400 people did that every Sunday? That would be awesome. Everybody would feel checked on, encouraged. They would go, boy, that church, they're just crazy about checking on everybody. And wouldn't it be great if you were the one who showed up and it was your child that wasn't there and your child told you that morning, I don't want to go to church anymore. I just turned 18 and I'm free to do 18 and I'm free to do my own thing. And you're just barely there. You almost didn't come yourself. And somebody comes by and says, hey, I noticed that so-and-so is not with you today. And you go, well, we really had a hard morning. And they sit down beside you and they say, can I pray for you real quick? Let's talk this week, have a little coffee or go do something. And man, suddenly we're getting that done. But that takes, let's back it up. It takes the knowledge that every time we get together, everybody's 
bearing up under something. It's a universal truth. They're either bearing what they've already experienced, bearing what they are experiencing, or they're bearing what is about to become an experience. And therefore, we need to take the time to consider and notice each other. We need to do good things of love and good deeds to provoke love and good deeds. We need to be there for them, and they need to count on us to meet with them, gather with them from big church to little things. And we need to make sure that when we walk away from them, that we gave them strength to hold on. I have people that do this in my life constantly. And I will tell you that I would not still be a pastor if I didn't have them. And I mean that. They've walked with me through fire and storm and stupidity, my own. And they have been there, and they've always given me strength. And they still do it. Everybody can do this. You can be an encourager by choice. This is not a matter of gifting. It's a matter of choice. Each of us are gifted differently. But all of us can encourage each other. And I think that's what the writer to the Hebrews was after, was a church that really noticed each other, a church that really sunk their hearts into doing these provoking things and not neglecting being together. And as a result, they were encouraging one another. So I'm going to pray that we become that. We are on our way. We have so much good and strength in us, but we're not there yet. Paul said that your love would excel still more. And I think that's something we can always say. We want our love to excel still more. So let me pray this over you. Father, in the name of Jesus tonight, I ask you for a great mercy upon your church to awaken us to the knowledge that everybody is bearing a load. And everybody is needing help hanging on. And we know that there is the work of your Spirit that ultimately determines our eternal destiny and our hanging on because you hang on to us. But you have shown us that somehow in that, you use the rest of us. So make us a people that decide to notice that decide to provoke, that decide to be here in whatever setting we need to be in, and that we decide that when we leave, we want to have encouraged in such a way that people were stronger because of us. I know that we can do this because we've been born again. I know we can do this because we have the Spirit of God. I know we can do this because we have your holy word. And so, Father, would you give us the push to motivate us that we may be obedient sons and daughters and a compassionate church that loves, builds up, and grows strong, mighty believers for the kingdom of heaven. Help me to be an example of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'm going to shut off our video feed, and we've got a couple of minutes. If you want to ask a couple of questions about this, I'm really happy to do that. So give me just a second.